Wonderful. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this March Necessary Conversation uh, with Mike Barnett, who's joining us um, as the Dean's Research Professor in the Department of Management and Global Business at Rutgers Business School in Newark and Brunswick. Um, and just we'll get started very, very shortly. I'll turn it over to um, Michael and Mike uh, momentarily. Uh, this is a, a, a research forum that we've had the great opportunity of hosting, I think, almost for almost 10 years now. Um, so it's thrilling to be back for spring 2024, kicking it off with Mike. Um, so this is an initiative of the International Humanistic Management Association. I'll be putting some things in the chat with some more information. As always, we're recording, so we'll keep everyone muted. Um, and we will also make this very, very interactive. So if you have comments or remarks, questions, please put those in the chat and we'll moderate from there. Um, I am going to turn it over to Michael shortly. Um, again, we've got Mike Barnett. His research is at that interface of stakeholders and firms and implications for society and the environment. And today we get to focus on how we get unstuck. So I'll turn it over to Michael. Well, thank you, Erica, and thank you, Mike, uh, for joining us. And thank thank you to everyone else who is interested in this conversation, because I think it's a very important one. Because uh, if you look at the news, I do think it's not just feeling stuck. It's like maybe hopeless. <laughs> and, and the question is, what can we do here uh, together? Um, and uh, Mike is a leading thinker in that field, and many of you are too. So maybe there is something we can do using the platform and the privilege that we have, and maybe also do that together, at least start a conversation about it. And that's what the conversation has been with Mike, who is um, lucky for us at Fordham, a visiting scholar with us in our group. And so there are several folks and, and colleagues at Fordham here on this call with me. So thank you all. And we're gonna, we said we wanna make this more public and available because it is part of a, an ongoing conversation. And I wanted to just frame that, that uh, we are hosting a conference in June three to seven that does give some research connection and pedagogical connection, uh, curriculum development connection with a number of other partners like the UN Principles of Responsible Management Education, Ashoka U, and uh, Conscious Capitalism and B-Lab. So a number of the groups that are interested in a similar way of repositioning the possibility of business. But I think this conversation here with Mike will go a little bit beyond that. So Mike, I'll just turn it over to you and maybe just give us the framing. And then it's an invitation to just have a conversation. But in the back of your mind, I hope that you also have maybe ideas of what can be done uh, and what maybe could be facilitated through what we're doing here, but also with the conference or maybe with conferences that you're hosting, et cetera. So happy springtime, as Erica says. <laughs> Mike, over to you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for everybody for showing up. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of structure to this. This is a kind of an open conversation is my understanding. And that's what we've been doing on Friday afternoons for a few weeks now is just trying to kind of brainstorm some processes for getting unstuck. So we didn't really have a lot of plan when we started this. It was just, let's see kind of where we overlap. And, uh, you know, I've been working on the business case for corporate social responsibility for a few decades. And, uh, you know, I, and when I first started this, uh, it was seen as the answer. I thought that this was going to get us somewhere in terms of uh, business, using the power of business, harnessing uh, all of that power, uh, those resources to uh, make the world a better place. And I was trying to find different ways of uh, making sure that we understood how the processes worked and, and saw the link between social and financial performance and all of that. And then as I push deeper and deeper into this, I see more and more roadblocks to that and how the profit motive basically gets firms it's a very good motivator for firm actions, but it only motivates them to do those things that actually then do earn profit. And those are not the same things that we're going to um, sustain society and the environment, uh, as it turns out, over time. So try to figure out, you know, we've got a lot of smart people spending a lot of time, uh, putting a lot of energy toward trying to find ways to think about how we can use businesses, resources to benefit society. Um, and after decades of that, we're still using the same frameworks that lead us to, you know, no solutions, but just more and more circles, really. Um, so we've been thinking about, you know, how do we 
combine kind of micro and macro and, and, you know, the substitute cooperation for competition. I mean, I think that competition mindset that leads firms to only do certain things um, that are going to benefit them, that hopefully also, by by the way, also benefit society. It's that same kind of logic of, of competing for market share that leads us in academia to kind of compete for mind share. And we're all trying to come up with our own grand theory of how to solve this and have ours be the most cited one and published in the best places. When in fact, we probably should be cooperating. And we should also be remember that government is out there as well. So it's not just business and society, but it's business, government and society. We need to find ways to kind of broaden the perspective, but also to cooperate across all of us to use our you know shared intellect and shared time and attention to come up with solutions that maybe aren't all attacking the big picture, but maybe we do get a sense of the gestalt big picture and what the problems are. And then we start to get down to the micro, right? And so instead of trying to describe, everybody trying to describe the overall body of the problem, we're down to the cellular level and we're kind of allocating out agreed, you know, people agree and teams agree to work on certain parts of this that we think is going to, you know, help to resolve this collectively if we get down to the micro parts of this. And so we, we kind of, Agree to a roadmap in a way that um, allows us to take piecemeal approaches that over time start to accumulate into answers and resolutions and get us past these roadblocks as opposed to all of us spinning our wheels, relabeling things for decades after decades while firms are doing whatever they want to do and using social and environmental responsibility as a cover to avoid regulation. So. Mostly we've been, you know, complaining, convention about this kind of stuff and and, uh, and trying to think about structures that would lead to solutions. We don't have any solutions, but our best bet for a solution is to come up with a structure to turn us all collectively toward that resolution as opposed to all of us competing for framing that resolution, I guess. Um, maybe we can start a discussion from that standpoint. First, does that make any sense or am I just blathering here? That makes great sense. And again, if if there are folks who want to, um, you know, put a remark or a question in the chat, that seems to be the one of the easiest ways we can moderate, especially as more and more people join. I do see hand up, so Donna, I'll, I'll I'm happy to invite you to uh, share anything you'd like to say. But if um, anyone has anything else, please put it in the chat. Thanks. I'll jump in with both feet. I haven't been active in this community for a while. It's nice to see you, Erica. And this is such an important subject. I am not an academic. Um, I, I do, um, <laughs> get involved in a lot of different things, um, that are very resonant with the themes that you've raised. And perhaps you can see that in some level by the name of the organization that, which, which I have is called institution with the belief that we need to institutionalize a lot of things. We need our healthy institutions. So it's not a bashing against, uh, those structures, uh, by any stretch. So I'm jumping in here more to stir the conversation, not to dominate by any stretch. I don't have the answers. I really resonate with what you're saying around cooperation. Uh, we need to learn ways, I think, to scale collaboration. But what I want to throw in here is some of the work that I feel we need to activate around the commons. So our society is so out of balance, business, government, civil society. And um, so the work that I've been doing is from the space between um, painfully arriving there, realizing that we can't seem to bring about the kinds of the order of change that we're all holding in our hearts, heads and hands. Um, and it needs all of us. And so uh, there's been a lot of work, um, very good work over the years about the commons, uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work, uh, David Sloan Wilson, lots of others. Um, and so what I'm particularly interested in is ways that we can do more uh, from that space between in the commons and and defining some new forms of work that can get done from that space, which is kind of the work that that I, I, and I'm not alone, others are involved in doing. And uh, the big the big hairy issue, uh, one big hairy issue is our uh, driving economic model, um, which is uh, feeding um, the very things that run against the values of what we all say we care about. Um, it, it's, it's, it's bankrupt of meaning and value in society. It's a mono capital model um, that, that, that is just about money and 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 ways that people can get ahead. 
So having said all that, I've already talked longer than I feel is is right under this under these sort of circumstances. Um, but I'm really wanting to hear from others, and I want to throw in. Um, some new work uh, it's, that's been around for a while and we're trying to find ways to bring it into the world, which is based on um, uh, the theories of uh, aug augudicity. Um, there are ways of pooling um, uh, uh, resources within ecosystems of companies, of organizations, going back to the root meaning of what a company was supposed to be, which we've lost bringing people together in, e companies together in ecosystems that are mutually uh, invested in one another. And it moves us toward a, a, a multi-capital kind of model uh, that where everybody can benefit, including the investors. So it is along the lines of shareholder, um, all, all stakeholders, not just the shareholders. Um, Did you say organicity? Ergod ergodicity. And ergodicity. this is building on the work of uh, Graham Boyd. I'm just throwing that out there, not saying that's the panacea for everything, but there's there's some really important work that we can bring to ground because we need to start, I believe, to shape some healthier ecosystems that are in service to life, people and planet. And we can't, we're not going to get there with the existing ways that we're doing things. And yet we have to recognize this is the world we live in. So, uh, you know, the three horizons model that kind of lives with where things are for real. It's not putting on Pollyanna uh, glasses and saying, you know, we've all got to leap to this, this new paradigm. We've got to find the, the pathways there. So it's horizon one, two, and three, it's, it's, which is based on the, the work of the International Futures Forum and Bill Sharp, which mm -hmm. recognizes that we, you know, we've got the, this challenge of na how do we navigate and how do we accept the world that we live in while at the same time find ways to build those bridges. So I'm going to, I mean, I could say a whole lot of stuff because I kind of live and breathe this and it's kind of the become my life purpose. Uh, but I'm going to stop there um, just having stirred the pot and welcoming what other, you know, other uh, discussions that people want to have. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. some of our, our conversations that we've had over the past Fridays have been kind of trying to bring that high level thought back down to at least an individual level and think about, you know, the reality is the business case kind of logic would drive firms to do the right thing uh, for society, for the environment. If stakeholders cared that much that they would actually drive them to do that if they stop buying bad things and stop working at bad companies and all but each individual is just a microcosm of the problem as well and so they don't really have the motivation a lot of the times to do to to take the actions necessary to get firms to do the right thing and so you know if we drive this down to the somewhat of the micro level then it would be like how do we get people to give a crap i mean how, how is it that um we get them to be kind of the agents of social change um and then everybody has very different perspectives on this. Um, so e each individual is has multiple different competing uh, interests. And so it gets kind of pretty complicated pretty quickly to try and think about if we, you know, if we get, get down to the individual level um, and make some changes that um, have them drive this from the bottom up. Uh, at the same time, we have government on top that can mandate certain things, but then that has such a, a broad hammer effect that, um, it can also disrupt uh, firms doing the innovative things that they need to do to solve some of these problems. And so we were talking about both top down and bottom up kind of approaches to get us to an overall solution. Um, but if we go over to Bruno. Yeah, a lot. Again, the reason I'm here is because a lot of the words we we're speaking, a lot of the ideas resonate and things I've cared about for quite a while. So thank you for that. So the business case model, uh, I um, has bothered me or, or I've recognized for a while that that's not going to get us there. It's going to be co-opted into the, the what I call the financial bottom line view. So the triple bottom line, we thought that might be the answer, but actually the ESGs and all that aren't really pushing the needle on sustainability. So for me, I've looked at it a, a, def a couple of different ways and I have a new paradigm and you all have paradigms. Mine is called social and ecological thought. And I've written a management textbook that, um, spells out the financial bottom line, triple bottom line, and social ecological thought ways of 
making decisions, of do, thinking about strategy, of doing communication, of managing groups and teams, of control, all of those things. And thank you to International Humanist Humanistic Association. Um, I've they, they gave me an award for that book. So I, we use it in the classroom. And what, what I liked about the book is it gives the practical, here's how to manage, here's how to make decisions, here's how to do the, and it's a very different process. So we, we go through the pair, so we go through the regular standard stuff, and then we go through this upside down stuff or this 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 weird stuff. So that that's one thing that um, I wanted to, to put onto the table. The second is, it is happening. What I call social ecological thought. There are organizations that are doing this. And um, about five or ten years ago, we did a, a, a all the case studies on sustainable organ organizing. Well, they were all actually triple bottom line approaches. They were all, we can make more money doing this. So we've now got a, a case study of, of 40 organizations that are um, putting people and planet ahead of maximizing profit. And we're studying those organizations and I'm happy to share those because that's what we need to study. The best practices are out there and building on what Donna said, it's all about community. Community is sort of the antidote, I think, to capitalism, if you want to put it that way, or the antidote to the unhealthy part of capitalism because we had markets, we had villages and, and it was face to face and we understood each other and, and it wasn't this widening gap and all of that kind of stuff there. So so my, my point is, I agree that we need to look at the high level, but we need to, we as scholars can translate that for managers. And that's, I think that's a high calling or that's an important thing we need to do. And we also need to learn from it. There are companies that are doing these things that we, want to, to scale or that we want others to do and let's learn their best practices and, and bring the shine a light on them but also bring those skills to, 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 to the readers who look at our stuff yeah and that's a key thing we've discussed as well in this group before the managers don't necessarily know how to do all these social and environmental goods themselves they're busy doing the, the work of the business on a day-to-day -day basis and so um, us bringing forth to them some best practices is, is great but then we started thinking, well, if, are these all scalable? I mean, are these things that if they're not an exceptional firm, if they become the norm, then does that take away the benefit that drove them to do it in the first place? If this is, you know, kind of based on market advantage, for example, then, you know, are is that really feasible itself over time? Um, if these best practices become common practices, are they then no longer best practices, basically? So when, we, when we've asked our companies who are doing this stuff, who are your competitors? More than half say, we don't use that language of competitors. We lose a language of collaborators and we want people to do what we're doing. These are best practices. We want to learn from them and we want to learn from us. That whole competitive model and first mover advantage and business case, that's thrown out the window. In some ways, some of them talk about, we'd like to be worked out of a job. If everybody else was doing this and we wouldn't have to, that'd be great. The world is, a, so it, it's a whole different paradigm, right? I think Roland may have something to add um, based on a textbook that he and collaborators have been working on as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all what was said now by, by Donna and by Bruno is what I have been working on for a while. I was in business for 30 years, started teaching after that, and went up from my international accounting field to <laughs> accountability. And then the accountability, which I'm mentioning in, in chat is, we are not accountable only as a business for our business. We are accountable for the, I say the public goods, the businesses use. And this is a, a very easy concept because if you look at sustainable development, it's about pro providing public goods, which are intact or maintain the intactness. So there is this connection only I am not finding many uh, contributors of, or, or, or even I was, I still have that context to big managers in, in Germany and, and, and government people. They don't really think this way. But it's business is business and public goods is public goods. But there is this relation. That's what I have to say. And my question is, anyone else? has this opinion and anyone else know way how to improve that uh, dealings that have to be done by firms with regard to the commons 
or the communal resources we all have to use. My big boss once said to me, we pay taxes. And I said, no, it's not true. We still use them if we don't pay taxes. If we have a loss, we still use them. So that's my contribution for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike, I don't know if you want to respond. I saw Michael had his hand up as well. Whatever is most timely. Yeah, I mean, my view ultimately is that, you know, the social and environmental good is really the province of government. Um, but business does not let government operate independently. And so if government, if business stayed out of those matters and like government and paid the taxes and actually, you know, didn't try and steer it, the government in a way that um, uh, made them non-partial referees, I guess, um, then I, I think it's reasonable. I mean, government's supposed to be the specialist in determining uh, what the uh, the needs of society and the environment are. And uh, uh, the problem is they don't. And so um, since firms are going to be such a dominant part of governance, then uh, we need to do the best that we can within that framework. But ideally, conceptually, at the broadest level, it would be great to get business independent uh, and have, you know, um, business, government, and society be kind of, you know, interdependent, but independent, uh, I guess, <laughs> parts of, of, a, of a, a nice, you know, three-legged stool of governance and not, uh, not have business basically dominate all of it. Michael, did you want to add something? I see Jim has his hand up as well. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to throw in at yeah, we do many things, right? And if many more people did what we did, the question is, would that get us unstuck? Or is is something else <clears throat> entirely necessary? And I'm just throwing in, in after World War II, as a society or whatever, we came up with new institutions that didn't exist before that are now currently sort of accepted as, as the standard set. What other institutions might we need? And you say uninstitution, and maybe there is a role for not institutionalizing, but I do think there may be a role for new institutions as well. So I'm just throwing this in for the conversation. Jim, did you wanna add as well? Oh, thank you. This has been a really, wonderful conversation already from my side, so I want to thank you for it. I've got about 10 items. I only mentioned one of them. Um, and talking about government triggered me just a moment ago. Uh, we live in a world where the lobbyists basically job is to distort government regulations in a ways that favor particular businesses. But there may be some exceptions. And what occurred to me was we might want to do a survey of people who are outliers. And so the question would be uh, to lobbyists, will you adhere to and support a pledge that as a lobbyist, you will only do things that are good for the common good, as well as good for your company, but you will renounce doing things that are harmful to society. Is there any lobbyist out there who would assign, would join that? Uh, pledge. And the context of my thinking in the last comment is Isabel Romanosi's work that many of you are familiar with, that she started like 20 years ago interviewing sustainability champions who were self-initiating sustainability champions, and it wasn't part of their job description. So I wonder if it might be fun to see if there's any lobbyists who are willing to engage in that conversation. So thank you. I mean, just my, my quick perspective is lobbyists will sign anything as long as there's not an enforcement mechanism uh, and it gains them anything, I would imagine. And and their definition of what's in the public interest is probably, you know, what's good for GM is good for the U.S. kind of kind of logic. So you'd be hard pressed to get them to, to define anything as as uh, as damaging to a society that they engage in. Um, but you know, Sandra's uh, got a question over here about how can we shift understanding a company's purposes? Um, I mean, it's taken, my view is it's taken, you know, several decades or, you know, uh, time of Reagan and Thatcher is kind of always the turning point that I see of, of seeing government as, as a problem and business as the only solution to anything. And then, then we've got the whole, you know, Friedman-esque stuff of companies existing only to make returns to shareholders um, has kind of dominated for a very long time, but that wasn't the original understanding. And so that was a change that occurred. We can look at historical patterns and see if there's some way to, you know, kind of 
do the reverse, kind of like, you know, cigarettes became uncool over time. Is there another way where we, we collectively kind of write our equivalent of the Surgeon General's report about companies and then sl kind of slowly start taking greed is good out of movies and don't let them advertise this. And, you know, I mean, it's a, a very long slog to do something like that, but uh, there are more micro ways. But um, I, I think, you know, just the starting point for us as academics, and there's only so much we can do as academics, um, is uh, is just kind of, I think, coming together and, and coordinating our efforts, which is the, the initial phase here so that we can kind of gel together and not all just scream around into the, into the ether and, and uh, not really have any collective impact as a result. I'll also just quickly add, um, and then I'm happy to look for anyone else who has comments. I, you know, it's really interesting in the research that I've been doing recently, um, you know, a, in theory, a firm that really does want to do the right thing, that's, you know, really a front runner in, in sort of the sustainability space. Uh, when you talk about government and regulations, um, they want to be doing the right thing. They they want to be keeping up with regulations, especially in Europe, but those are changing and ratcheting up so quickly that a lot of their efforts are spent, you know, just basically reorganizing the paperwork, the back end without doing more of the front end that they all know they need or want to do. So I think that's also a bit of a paradox, even with government regulation, um, you know, in, in spirit, hoping to enforce, you know, more sustainable actions. Companies, in fact, are wasting a lot of resources just in the back end paperwork to keep up. Any other perspectives or? I mean, how many of you would uh, agree to kind of cooperate uh, on some sort of collective effort um, if we started to come up with a grand plan and then doled out parts, you know, to individuals to work on over multi-year periods to try and kind of put bricks in a wall effectively to uh, to solve this at least as much as we can? Yeah, and maybe just to add to that, I think there's, I think Don Hambrick, when he was president of the Academy of Management, said, like, okay, there's an academic like council that advises the government. And why shouldn't there be something like that that would advise business people or the government from the management and, uh, well, the Academy of Management to some degree? Because that does have direct impact on the quality of life of all people. <laughs> Um, and that, that may be another institution. I'm just putting this out there. The other thing is, um, yeah, working <laughs> the way that we work as scholars is, is, of course, silo style. And breaking those, many people have talked about it. We've tried to do this with this forum in different ways. And Mike, you're coming in as the editor for the Academy of Management Perspectives. Maybe there are some ways we have journals also where we can offer outlets for a perspective like that. And it's still, I think, unusual for traditional academics to write in that way or even be bothered by that. Um, and we are hosting conferences and spaces where we bring people together. So I just wanna throw this in there as uh, these impulses may have some resonance somewhere if if you're interested in taking that up or taking that on or if you have an institution etc that is doing that kind of work as well so just throwing this in there for yeah to 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 see what can be done to get unstuck and i see motaba and i hope i'm saying your name correctly would you like to chime in yeah i just uh, in terms of collaboration so i agree that collaboration between and those people who think we should go beyond capitalism or have an anti-capitalism anti narrative, post growth um, set kind of management, ecocentrism. We have a lot of narratives that pushing us going beyond capitalism, which is fine. And I, I agree that we should collaborate with each other. But I'm uh, just uh, of concern that we may polarize the world again how we can collaborate with already people who are motivated with market. So how we can include them in our uh, narrative. So, so bring a 
kind of uh, a stronger uh, momentum for change. As I just sort of quickly typed out, at least from my perspective, I I think there's still you know plenty of great uses for capitalism. I'm I'm, I'm not uh, at least from my perspective, I'm not saying let's all turn to socialism and and throw out the market model. I, I think it's it's great for what it can do. I think we've done the opposite though over the last several decades, and we've just assumed that the market can solve all these problems because of reputational mechanisms or that you know stakeholders such as employees and consumers and suppliers and so forth can. Um, contain firms. There is this inherent kind of model that underpins the business case that says that, you know, firms are smart enough to know that they're going to get hurt if they do bad things and they're going to get rewarded if they do good things. And so, of course, over time, they're going to get better. So we've been playing that out for 50 years or more, and, and it's not happened. Um, they just get better and better at figuring out how to get around those things. And on the reverse side of it, I mean, what I've done some work on is just showing that the stakeholders are really terrible at... Um, rewarding and punishing firms for these good and bad behaviors. And so firms get mixed in wrong messages and, and, and all they do in the end is basically, uh, you know, basically keep government regulation at bay that would do a, a better job at uh, controlling a lot of these bad behaviors. So um, we need a proper mix. I don't think we have a good sense. We just have two sides. And this is, I often step into papers from this perspective of saying a bunch of people are screaming that this is the right way. A bunch of other people are screaming that that's the right way. You know what? It's both of them within certain areas and certain ranges, and so figuring out kind of where the different parts hold and how they might be mixed, um, to me, is is the way to go about these types of things, as opposed to just um, declaring all everybody should be full capitalist or everybody should be full socialist or whatever. Um, I think it's more about particular problems um, require particular solutions that are always evolving, and there might not even be any sort of stasis in any of this stuff. Ralitza, did you want to contribute as well? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would just like to respond to Mike's comment that whether we as academics really matter to counteract what he just said. Uh, uh, basically, Friedman is a perfect example of how influential academics can be. This change towards marketization and the shareholder view, etc. And to that, I want to add that as academics, maybe we have made ourselves less relevant. And at least from my perspective, the way for us to go forward is to look at more phenomena driven research rather than what we are doing in management, which is pretty much theory driven and em emphasis on theories rather than just looking at explaining phenomena. So I think there is a way for us to go forward and to make ourselves more relevant, but um, we need to look beyond our, not only silos, but beyond our current paradigm in research. And, 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 and I know that Perspectives is one outlet. And of course there is the Academy of Management Discoveries, which is another journal. Uh, which pays attention to more of this kind of phenomena driven research, but I think it's up to us, especially in our roles as reviewers and editors to make it more prominent that, uh, to indicate to authors that that's what we're looking for. Yeah, well, I mean, we definitely can make a difference. But, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of us doing this for decades upon decades, and we got like one guy that we mentioned nonstop. So <laughs> people win the lottery too, but most people don't most of the time. And so we should have more collective impact, I think, if we cooperate instead of us all trying to all be, you know, that one famous guy who probably wasn't that much of an academic anyway, but did become kind of a, a TV star over time. I know Sandra and Donna have both added comments um, about reimagining and paradigms and action research. Uh, yeah. Erica, let me let me pose the question to Mike. Um, you so you're no no yeah yeah you're no, setting no, up no. you're setting up the dichotomy that we all fall into all the time of capitalism versus socialism, and I just have to believe we have to reimagine things in new ways um, and reimagine how our societies work, 
for the common good and for the good of and 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 the reason i don't think stakeholder capitalism will get us where we need to go is that it basically ignores the natural environment and other beings and we humans are absolutely dependent on nature and you can't ignore that sort of bigger context so i would i mean i don't necessarily have an answer to that question but i'd pose it to you mike because you're trying to get us unstuck here <laughs> i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as Michael said, he, you know, there are other perspectives and, and there are combinations of things and nobody, you know, nobody's doing pure capitalism or pure socialism or communism. It's all kind of this blended muck of, of all kinds of stuff. Um, I think practicalism is, is uh, maybe something to, to frame it as a lot of the time. But um, I guess I'm kind of viewing it as can we get there through, I don't know, evidence based approaches that start at a much smaller level and kind of build into that as opposed to all of us kind of collect, all of us independently dreaming up our own framing of this type of thing. Um, I, that's what we've been doing for a while. And I probably somebody already has the answer out there is, is what the framework is. And it might be humanism, might be whatever. Um, but we we're all we're doing is putting our own labels on these things. And, 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 and if anybody can, you know, I, we have that uh, Brian Houston and Irene Henriquez and I have this paper in um, Academy of Management. Is it in perspectives? Might be perspectives few years back about, you know, the notion that the internet was supposed, the digital age was supposed to make us all these, uh, you know, give power to all uh, individuals so that they could control companies. And, and it was going to be a brave new world. Democracy was going to shine because the Arab Spring, people could tweet things that made crowds go crazy. And, and all it did was just make everybody scream a little bit louder. Everybody has a megaphone now and everybody screams their own perspectives. And Coordination, which is instant and costless now, is actually more difficult because everybody has their own view that they can just say it's the right one. And I'm going to shout it here until everybody comes around to my corner and then nobody ever does. And we have a whole bunch of leaders and no followers. Uh, and so I, I think we, we really need a, a system. Our, for us, I mean, practically talking about what we do, uh, our day job, um, we just we need to work together to coordinate something um, that really still keeps us all busy and motivated and doing things that are going to build up. I mean, we, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, Adam Smithian in a way. I mean, it's still like the invisible hand of us. I, I don't know if we're making this visible. I don't know if this actually is communism or capitalism. I, I don't know we're working it's independently, cool. but whatever the case, we need to kind of coordinate our efforts in a way that is going to accumulate knowledge that allows us to eventually come up with a view that is probably not going to be right, but continuously can be adapted as new evidence is, is added to that wall to, to make it more and more, more and more reflective of what should be happening. So Mike, can I respond a little bit? Because what you're talking about is what my new book calls catalyzing transformation. It's coming together in new ways. It's assuming that no one person or one group has all the answers and co-creating an emerging new perspective. And that's what I'm hearing you ask us to do. And, you know, as academics, of course, independent contributors for the most part, and it's hard for us to do that, but you're abs I think you're absolutely right that we need to begin to cohere our efforts in entirely new ways um, around different messaging, around purpose of business, around the systemics, the systemic solutions. Um, and it just strikes me as wildly appealing to most academics if they think it through. Uh, because we're all going for that big hit that's going to get all those sites that's going to reframe everything <clears throat> in language. We all want to be, you know, Jay Barney or whatever and have this new view, but we're not going to be. And so um, we spend most of our time trying to convince editors that our framing is correct to then take the rest of the paper. But what we should be spending our time in on is doing that actual dirty work, like, you know, experiments and studies and collecting data and all that stuff. And then the easy part, the automatic part should be just, you know, of course, we're answering a real problem that matters, um, but we're not doing it that way we're, because we haven't really coordinated all that and been very clear about where the needed research studies are. Instead, our, most of our time, and the only reason I'm successful is because I'm pretty good at making people believe that there's this gap somewhere, but that shouldn't be a, a valued skill. It should be actually filling the damn gap in, in specific ways uh, over time, but so if we could coordinate things, uh, then we could start, we could just tell people, spend your 40 or 30 or 20 hours, whatever it is a week on doing exactly this. Uh, and we get a lot more done with a lot less resources. And imagine if we had 20,000 academics spending their waking hours on a coordinated effort. Um, I feel like we could uh, do a lot more than just spin around in cycles and scream at each other in, in paper form.
Donna, did you want to add? Sure, uh, I'll throw some things in here. There, there's a lot going on in the world. There are a lot of these groups meeting and having these conversations, different flavors of these very same conversations. I'm sure some of you have been in them. And um, the stuckness that you speak to, many people are speaking to that as well. And so we're nodding our heads when you talk about the need for us to collaborate more and to find ways of grounding some of this. So I'm, I'm jumping back in to say, yes, and it won't be one answer, as you've said, it will be multiple. Um, I think some of what we're talking about is finding ways to move more towards a pluriversal way of addressing these things. And living lab kinds of initiatives, um, many, and, and where academics can potentially do more um, action research, action learning, warning, working in, um, concert in coordination with people that are actually trying to bring this uh, into places and spaces. So there is, you know, there's work that's being done around the whole area of regeneration. Um, there's work that's being done, um, you know, I'm mentioning a few of these things, the work of uh, Nora Bateson, uh, who talks very much about all of this stuff is messy. It's, it's relational. So it's taking the things that are conceptual and bringing them into real live working environments where people can start to apply this stuff. So it's not about impact on society, it's impact in society as a participant and recognizing that as participants, we are also having an impact on what we're observing. We're part of that. And yes, David Sloan Wilson and his work around pro-social world, um, the work of Joe Brewer in um, Regenerators, and there's a whole lot of folks that are working in the whole Regen space. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm jumping in here because, again, I mean, I'm at, I'm at the last stage of my career in my life, and as many of us are, looking for ways that we can support and recognizing none of us are masters of the universe. No one of us is going to be able to pull this off. So isn't it ironical? Today is International Women's Day, and some of this has to do with us living into the I don't knowness of the reality of our world right now. We don't know. We have some patterns. We've got pieces. We've got great wisdom. There's already plenty of information about all that's wrong. There's tons. There's books. And the reality is on a planet of 8 billion people, most people aren't going to read the books. They're not going to read the books. They're not going to hear us. They're not going to hear me. And I write all kinds of papers as well. They're not published in academic places, but they're addressing things like polarization, which is affecting all of us, AI, um, uh, the labels, and, and you've raised this. I mean, we've got to get underneath the labels of things like capitalism, because when we get underneath them and we get into re real conversations amongst us, we discover where the common ground is. And in some instances, there's a lot more common ground than we realize because of mainstream media and the stuff that we're constantly being fed. So Anna, there's a lot. On that note, sorry to interrupt. I just, I know there are a couple more people who wanted to get a word in. So uh, if you, do you have anything else to? No, thanks for stopping me. I'm the and and lady. It's like, I'm never quite finished. So it's perfectly okay to interrupt. Thank no, that's you. great. And I think I, Mike maybe wants to respond, but I, I do want to make sure with limited time, we have a chance to hear from folks. No, I mean, I'm glad to hear from other folks, too. I've, I've kind of uh, blathered on quite a bit already. Okay, so I saw um, uh, Julita had a hand up earlier. No, not currently. No, that was a mistake. Uh, Ellie had put a comment in the chat. Yes, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Erica. It's just, uh, I was just... Uh, 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 commenting on the higher level of coordination, which of course I agree, but the point is there that maybe some things need to be in a way focused more closely, like shared goals, shared needs and all these th things, and uh, especially respect, mutual respect. Like I think sometimes that um, either way, uh, there is some, I wouldn't say lack, but I would say limited, limited uh, respect. So uh, before the coordination takes place, some other issues need to be addressed more openly and regularly. 
and clearly. Uh, so uh, the whole relationship is recreated and um, uh, the the collaboration and doing together things then will, will happen more easily. So I think we need to work a bit before in order to achieve this higher level of coordination. So that's basically what. And of course, with greater information, sometimes information might be missing from the parts like stakeholders, academics. We think we know, but we don't always know exactly what's going on for, for the others. So yeah, that's all <laughs> for now. So if I just want to can make an added comment, we have platforms, right? We do have all the Academy of Management platforms, the conferences. Everybody here probably is connected to conferences that they're organizing themselves. If there is a way to to just align some of the narratives, I think that that can help. Um, if people are sort of seeing themselves as a as, as Otto would say, the system seeing itself, being self aware. Of, uh, of a greater community. I think that can be a stepping stone for sure. If there are elements like, and then I would like Mike to maybe elaborate on your vision for AMP to see like how and what can be done through the existing venues. And then maybe what can be done uh, in, in, on top of that, in addition, some of the institutions do their work very well <laughs> and, and maybe some don't, but I think uh, what we have access to, we can potentially repurpose. So any, any, any comment, Mike, that. Well, I mean, so the mission of AMP has changed in, uh, in the last few months and, and its intent is to have uh, rigorous research that uh, solves real world problems. So combining rigor and relevance, which has been, the aim for a very long time of, of many journals and, uh, you know, hopefully we can achieve it. But again, that's a, another difficult lift. Um, but it starts from the standpoint of the papers deal with actual practical problems and then find solutions to them uh, in rigorous ways. Um, and so, you know, we talked here about the special issues that might um, take a very concerted effort to um, take, you know, multiple angles on, on, a, on a very specific uh, real world problem. Um, and uh, that's one outlet. I mean, because you know, somebody, I'm trying to keep up with some of the comments too. And, and the comments, you know, include all of our own self interest, which is what drives a fair bit of our action here in terms of our need to publish in high quality journals to, um, at, you know, stay in and advance within our profession. And so AMP is one of those outlets that probably counts for most folks. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that we can do that isn't, you know, once we have more discretion, I think a lot of us have more discretion than to have to publish in a, in a top journal every time that we do anything. Um, we can do much more coordinated things that have effects on policy and practice and, and other ways. We can even, you know, put out books. I mean, my my pipe dream of all of this, uh, something I've shared here before, is um, kind of a manager's desk reference um, that's a, a Kind of a, an analog to the to the physician's desk reference, a thing that talks about drug interactions that shows, you know, this given drug does act behaves this way under certain circumstances with these people. And so, if we had that kind of equivalent where we had, you know, we had specific dependent variable, and we knew how it interacted with different independent variables across different moderating and mediating conditions, and different people did evidence, you know, did, they did the studies that validated that across different conditions over time, and continuously updated and checked that. Um, then we'd have a more rigorous way of you know, giving advice to managers about how certain things should work. And that includes if you want to, you know, help clean up the water in, in your community of 100,000 people that is, you know, near a mountain or whatever, this is kind of how you go about doing that. Here's some, some good advice on doing that. Um, but, you know, it'd be kind of a collective good that over time would kind of spring from the individual actions of researchers who are still doing their, their own self-interested work. Um, but, it would be done in a coordinated way that allowed, you know, accumulation of knowledge and updating of that knowledge. I mean, another perspective too is that, and what keeps this from happening a lot of the times is that, you know, who, who gets to dictate what the overall picture is that then everybody contributes to. Um, and that, you know, there's not a good answer to that other than to say that that's kind of an evolving thing and there could be multiple groups as there already are, and they can all work on their independent thing. But if we're all just, if we all let a thousand flowers bloom, 
and then somebody comes around and judges which is the prettiest flower, then, uh, you know, 999 flowers have been wasted, basically. So um, is there some way that we, you know, can coordinate that? So maybe we only have three or four flowers going uh, and they can each be kind of the best uh, of that bunch. So I see Diego had put a comment and you're welcome to chime in. I know Jim had his hand up for a little bit and there may, of course, as usual, be a flurry of folks in the last couple of minutes. Um, but Diego, did you want to add anything? Um, well, it's just pretty much that as a junior scholar, sometimes it's really hard to navigate all the tenure procedure and at the same time trying to trying to do your research on the things that are of your interest regarding to not to be unstuck or to solve other social issues. It's just hard when you have to think about that and at the same time you have to think of how to get your tenure because you have to do the teaching, you have to do the service, you have to do uh, your research that has to be published and better in better outlets. And sometimes it's just hard to navigate through that. I didn't want to make it sound like I'm complaining. I just found it really hard to navigate with it. But at the same time, I try to fit time in order to be able to, for instance, be present in, in, this, in this Zoom talk with all of you. Yeah, that's something that's been, you know, discussed a lot uh, over time as well as how to uh, basically make our own career interest jive with the public good or, you know, are we putting too much emphasis on the high stakes essay contest that requires us to just talk to each other in circles um, in order to succeed in the profession? And, um, you know, it, it's a real challenge because, you know, it's easy for me to talk once I'm past that, but, you know, during the process of getting tenure and still, and it's still an issue for everybody uh, to advance and to be mobile um, is the requirements uh, for, you know, tenure and, and advancement at your institutions. And if it's all FT50 list, uh, then, then it comes down to, well, what do those FT50 want? Well, um, and then it becomes, you know, a matter of accreditors and then it becomes, a you know, there's just so many layers here that, Ultimately, if I don't know, some benevolent God dictator doesn't come down and dictate it, then it would never get solved. And that's not going to happen. So where do we start? Um, I, don't, I don't have an easy answer other than to say that I think um, the more that we can get kind of a unified perspective on some of these things, the better chance we have of changing things um, rather than all of us kind of independently uh, screaming about it and coming up with our own idea of how it would be resolved. So there, there's lots going on in the chat. A lot of resources have been posted there. So definitely check that out and we will save that chat. Jim, I know you had hoped to make a comment. So you're on. Uh, I, I, I took my hand down because I had too much to say because this was uh, too stimulating a, uh, a session. It's been really, really helpful to me. I guess the, the one piece I would say is that we're stuck in a system that uh, is incredibly powerful and incredibly consistent and it's a system and it's yielding results that we don't like, like income inequality, poverty, and the end of the planet, the way it is. And so what I'm what came up for me is two models of dealing with a system. One is looking for the silver bullet that will actually end this Borg-like situation we're in. And the other one is bee stings. And I think I think I'm going to advocate bee stings. That we do a lot of a lot of a lot of things, for parts of the system that are broken, and while we simultaneously maybe look for a silver bullet, but I'm not optimistic we can reach agreement on a silver bullet. But bee stings might help us a bit. Period. <laughs> yeah, I think there's some good buzz behind bee stings if you want to keep that going. But um, so yeah, it's it's just the question of. Which bees doing which stinging? Um, there might need to be some coordination of the bees' plan of attack. And I see again, we only have a few minutes left, but I know that um, Linda had posted a few great questions um, in the chat. Linda, do you want to pose those to everyone just to get them out in the world? They are in the chat. Everyone can refer there as well, but go ahead if you're inclined to chime in. Uh, 
Is Linda still here? Maybe not. Well, uh, she asked uh, very good questions, uh, one of which was, is there a model of dealing with chaos and uncertainty that builds consensus and alignment of purpose? Is there a model to move from discussion to action? Um, I think that's a uh, sort of applied academic question. Um, if anyone knows the answer to that, chime in either now or in the chat. Um, did anyone else want to very quickly either share a remark, question, resource before we wrap up? And I can turn it back over to, to Mike and Michael. Um, there is this conference coming up in June. That's in the in the chat. Uh, we'll make sure everyone has access to that and a follow-up. Um, I think more information and planning will be happening in the very near term around that. Yes. So if, uh, thank you, Erica. And, th and just maybe as a reminder, if you're stimulated by this conversation and uh, you want to work with this group or aligned groups, the invitation is that that's already happening, of course, as, as all of you probably know in different ways. And so the question is really, how can we cohere it? I think, Sandra, you mentioned that. How can we cohere this in a way that actually provides stepping stones without overthinking it, uh, but still being in a space where we can move forward to get unstuck in certain in certain ways. And I think um, Otto Schama calls it acupressure points. To understand and find those acupressure points, how can we sort of rub <laughs> the right spaces in the system to get blood flowing again and, and maybe address certain things and, and, and start healing? Um, Whatever metaphor we use, uh, the invitation is that we continue this conversation. <laughs> if you're interested in that, please reach out to Erica, Mike, myself, or anybody else here on this call. Uh, if you're able to join the conference, please do so. The chat and the link is in the chat. Um, and uh, if there are other ways that you want to engage, there are all kinds of other platforms, of course, at the Academy of Management and beyond. And I do invite everybody to consider the Academy of Management Perspectives as a potential venue <laughs> now that Mike is taking that over. And of course, the Humanistic Management Journal, if you have something you want to publish in that space. Um, anything else? I really thank you, Mike, again, and maybe you, you just have the last words. Thank you. Oh, no, I just appreciate the opportunity. And uh, it's it's weird. I'm actually a big fan of bureaucracy and structure, and I, I don't normally come into something without knowing already what I'm going to say, and I like PowerPoints and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a very different environment for me, and so I'm, I'm glad to have an opportunity to do more of kind of freewheeling things and, and you know, admit ignorance of this and, and try and find ways to kind of structure and sort through it. Ultimately, still, I want to bring the whole damn thing together and have a very <laughs> kind of a, a flow of exactly how it's all going to fit together. But um who knows if that's feasible, but um, I still really do think that notion of cooperating as academics to come up with, um, you know, a, a long term structure um, that is changing, but um, has some sort of overall aim um, could be pretty valuable. Well, on that note, and we're almost right on time, I think it's probably a good opportunity to wrap up. Um, thank you, everyone, on behalf of the International Humanistic Management Association for joining this necessary conversation today. Uh, this recording will be available to you all. I believe that link will be emailed out to you if you've registered, as will the chat. Um, but again, many, many thanks. Wonderful to see you all. And Mike, thank you very much. Also, Michael and everyone who's contributed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.